boy, you could practically see and feel the company dine in real time. I'm John Renton with the Retroview WCW Uncensored 1999 from Freedom Hall in Louisville, Kentucky. 15,000 some odd fans. They were pretty raucous at the beginning. And boy, they were booing the fucking shit out of this by the time the main event rolled around. And given the fact that it was Ric Flair versus Hulk Hogan in a barbed wire first blood steel cage match for the WCW Championship, if Flair lost, he'd have to retire. If he won, he'd be president for life. You didn't think they gimmicked that up a little bit too much? No, no, WCW never did that. It's fine, it's fine. Actually, WCW would end up having Spring Stampede a month later. That turned out to be the last really great pay-per-view they ever had. Any other great moments that they had afterwards were mixed in with a whole bunch of bullshit and convoluted stuff and the AOL Time Warner merger. And then Russo came along in October of 99 and pretty much creatively finished the rest of the company off. Yeah, I'm not going to be very kind to this pay-per-view. There were some good moments, but it was also convoluted, messy, and it got to the point where everybody was just getting in there to do a whole bunch of their own shit without any regard to making the matches make any sense. So no rules, no mercy, no way out. Wait, that's another pay-per-view. So we get clips of the barbed wire cage being built and clips of Flair and Hogan. I always found it funny with WCW recap packages, unless they include television clips, like from Nitro and then later Nitro and Thunder, you know, how they would build, like, oh, this is what led to this and this. And they would do this weird, tuk -a -tuk -a -tuk -a thing, you know, to go from clip to clip. They would always do black and white or even, you know, like oddly, like put together video packages where you get a little bit of audio or in some cases, no fucking audio. So unless you knew how these guys talked and you were just seeing this stuff as a refresher, you had no fucking idea. If you were just tuning in, if you were just watching this with friends, saying, oh, I'd like to see what this wrestling's about. Wait, what's going on? Then you got to have your friends explain this stuff. And by the time the friends explained all this convoluted shit going on in WCW, you missed the first five minutes of the match. Well, three minutes of intros and entrances and then two minutes of the match. <clears throat> so lots of pyro and Shivani welcomes us along with Heenan and Mike Tanay. Bobby Heenan, even at this point, was still in rare form because he was just having a whole lot of fun. And they talk about the main event. Mean Gene says, well, these matches are unsanctioned by WCW. Why is it on a pay-per-view broadcast then? Oh, it's unsanctioned, but we're going to give you the pay-per-view clearance. Didn't make a whole lot of sense. Also, plug the hotline, 1-900-909-9900. Kids, get your parents' permission before calling. So, the phone number is no longer active, by the way. I'm glad that WCW, you know, went under because, God forbid, if they didn't end up, you know, if they didn't end up going under, if they still had the hotline going on, it'd be really awkward to find out who was actually still doing the hotline considering Mean Gene unfortunately passed away a couple years ago. Rest in peace, Mean Gene. But at least WWE puts up no longer active. Anybody who's still going to call a phone number for a long defunct company probably deserves to have their phone bill run up. So we get Billy Kidman uh, taking on Mikey Whipwreck for the WCW Cruiserweight Championship in a pretty damn good opener. In fact, I would argue probably the best thing on the show, Mikey Whipwreck making his WCW pay-per-view debut, I think even his WCW debut, but he would have a very short run. I think by August, <coughs> late August, early September of 99, he was gone from the company. He was back in WCW soon after, right after they got television clearance to be on TNN. And this was pretty good stuff. Mikey was working as a heel. He, obviously, because Kidman was going to be the de facto babyface, getting pretty big pops. They did a good job with Kidman initially, breaking him away from the flock and giving him some runs as WCW champion. Or WCW Cruiserweight champion. God forbid if they ever made him world champion. That would have been something. But they gave him Cruiserweight title runs. And Kidman was pretty good. He wasn't great, but with the right people, he could do some good stuff. And he had that natural charisma as far as, like, getting you to watch him in the cruiserweight division. Now, if you try to make him a main eventer, eh, okay, that didn't really work. And then, unfortunately, injuries bit him when he got to WWE. So, <clears throat> there was some good... Some good uh, heel work by Whipwreck with some good groundwork. At one point, Heenan kept calling him Shipwreck or um, Neck Whip or whatever. He just kept making fun of him. Uh, there were some guardrail spots that was, were kind of brutal. And fun fact, Mikey Whipwreck was basically going to be taking time off due to a bunch of injuries that he had in ECW. Would make sporadic appearances in uh, WCW. 
And that was and that was basically it. Like there there really wasn't a lot to his career. I think his last uh, pay per view appearance was at the Great American Bash ninety nine. Was a Bash? I think it was Bash at the Beach ninety nine, the Junkyard Brawl. Remember where people had to get out of a junkyard or they would get blown up? No, really, that was something that WCW did. And Russo wasn't even part of the company yet. So we had a diving clothesline for two, nice reverse DDT drop for two, and then Shooting Star eventually one, two, three. Kidman gets the victory. Pretty good pop. Pretty good opening match. Unfortunately, it is all downhill from here. It is a steep, steep, steep decline and a steep drop like Homer Simpson falling off of a goddamn cliff. So we get a package on Stevie Ray and Vincent. Whoever thought that Vincent should actually talk, cut promos, or work in the ring outside of being Virgil past a 1991, I will have no idea. Oh, we get another package on the cage main event. We also got a video package earlier on Nash and Ray for their match a little bit later. We get Stevie Ray versus Vincent in a Harlem street fight for leadership of NWO Black and White. Because that was basically just a C-Squad, and C-Squad's being generous. Horace Hogan, I believe Scott Norton was there, and poor Scott Norton. Great talent, uh, especially in New Japan. Former IWGP heavyweight champion. And carried Ice Train to a pretty good uh, you know, tag team as far as power, but... Norton deserved a whole lot better than WCW, but then again, he had all those commitments going on in New Japan and made a whole lot more money and was a, and was treated with a lot more respect. And also, Horace Hogan was in this. This was bad. They go into the crowd for you know in a sectioned off area where there's a whole bunch of chairs, and then Horace hands a slapjack to Vincent. Vincent takes forever because apparently he's distracted by the shiny object. It gets kicked out of his hand. And Stevie Ray hits the pedigree uh, variation, which he calls the Slapjack. One, two, three. He's a leader of NWO Black and White, which I believe was done by, if not the following month, by May. And it's funny that the NWO would basically be done by early 2000. <clears throat> like, I think maybe March of 2000. The NWO went out with a goddamn whimper. It probably should have been done mostly by the time Sting, you know beat Hogan at Starcade 97, but no, they fucked that up, because Sting wasn't tan enough. That is still something that will stick in my craw for the rest of my goddamn wrestling life. Just me being a passionate wrestling fan, not understanding how you couldn't do the obvious. But, then, WCW.com, uh, you know, known idiot, uh, Mark Madden, talks to Chris Jericho. Madden, unfortunately, talks to Mikey Whipwreck a little bit later. I like to remind people that Mark Madden actually got paid for years to be in WCW, which was a titanic waste of money. Fitting, because the Titanic was actually smaller than he was. So anyway, Nash with Luger and Liz took on Ray, and unmasked Ray, but Ray was never unmasked. Let's not even talk about the fact he was unmasked for about two fucking years in WCW, looking like a 15-year-old kid playing dress-up. And that's not knocking Ray, the mask gave him the identity. It, it made him stand out. You can unmask ones like Psychosis, was what it was. <laughs> Hoovy had some pretty good success until he self-destructed because he was on all the drugs in the known universe. But you could you, you can unmask people and it could work. Conan worked pretty good when you unmask him. But Ray, Ray needed that. But no, WWE now is going to treat it like, oh my god, Ray's unmasked, we can't see his face. We've fucking seen his face. If you're a longtime wrestling fan, or even if you have the power of Google, you will know that Ray was unmasked at some point. Um, Luger interferes after Ray gets an early flurry and everything, and Nash hits a big boot and hits a jackknife, one, two, three. This is after Nash had beaten Ray, unmasked him, and they'd done all this stuff, and Liz looked fucking terrific. Luger was a goddamn cow on ice at this point. Whatever. <clears throat> Brett wasn't part of this match. Brett was not part of this pay-per-view. Sting was not part of this pay-per-view. I think Scott Hall, I don't remember if he was in rehab or if they just were giving him time off, but... Oh, some firepower was not there, and they decided to rely on Stevie Ray and Vincent and other people in matches because let's keep the high-powered guys at home. Well, then again, actually, I think Brett might have suffered a knee injury. <clears throat> I know him and Goldberg had that thing in Toronto, and I think that was after... I want to say it was right before or right after this paper because I know it was in March of 99. And then Brett suffered a knee injury, and then Brett came back after Owen uh, had that tragic fall in Kemper Arena, where Vince McMahon still, you know, will will pay heavily for what he fucking did, and not using the right uh, harness company, and knocking Martha Hart a whole bunch of stuff, and I'll just talk about that at another point. 
I may retro review Over the Edge at some point. It would be so Over the Edge 99, by the way, because there was 98. I would really be, it would really be difficult for me to objectively review that, though. If you want me to, let me know in the comments. So we get a brief, uh, you know, we get brief promos and a little bit of build for the hardcore three-way between Hack, a.k.a. Sandman, Raven, and Bam Bam Bigelow. Jerry Flynn taking on Ernest Miller and Sonny Ono. Jerry Flynn was tall, had martial arts ability, and I didn't give two flying fucks about this match because it wasn't very good. Uh, they did have a bit of a feud because he got his little ponytail mullet thing cut, and he pinned Sonny after a few minutes. This was abysmal and had no business being on pay-per-view. Bam Bam Bigelow took on Hack and Raven, and also Chastity or Cassidy, or I, I forget what her exact name was. She was a girl with a lot of eye makeup and dreads, <clears throat> and she brought a giant laundry cart down full of weapons, and people just used everything. They used gas cans, they used uh, ironing boards, they used all this goddamn bullshit. Beat each other in the skull with chairs. I'm glad they don't do underprotected chair shots anymore, or at least the vast majority of people don't. Unprotected chair shots were always stupid. Um, and this was, it, it was, it wasn't dull, but it wasn't great because it just got, it, this went for about 15 minutes and probably should have gone six to seven. You could have just done a wild brawl and done that, but they wanted to fill pay-per-view time. So let's have this go. I'd like to remind again, Bret Hart, Sting, <clears throat> Goldberg. I mean, Goldberg is out. I think Goldberg had <clears throat> some kind of injury, but they had all these people out. You couldn't have utilized more cruiserweights in this kind of stuff. Utilize some luchadors and maybe put another match on and said Jerry Flynn, Sonny Ono, and Ernest Miller, and Stevie Ray and Vincent. That's not even knocking Stevie Ray. But this was this was not a well put together pay per view, and they let these guys go long and use use everything under the sun and above the sun and un you know under the morning sun. <laughs> and Hack eventually gets a gets the victory after Chastity or Cassidy, whatever her name is, turns on Raven and uses the fire extinguisher. We get about 15 tables being broken and Hack wins. Yay, cool. Okay, whatever. God damn it. WCW tag team title lumberjack match. Okay, lumberjacks. Lumberjacks with leather straps. So let's see who the lumberjacks were. Chris Adams. I totally do not remember Chris Adams being on WCW contract at this point. Norman Smiley, Prince Iakea, Hugh Morris, Bobby Duncan Jr., who unfortunately would pass away, I believe, in January of 2000, January, February 2000, Kenny Chaos, <coughs> Ming, and Kendall Wyndham. And the participants were Barry Wyndham and Denim, a lot of Denim, 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 Kurt Henning versus Malenko and Chris Benoit. Chris Benoit among leather straps. It was like a buffet for him to just get ideas for about eight years down the road. No, I can't forget that. I can't ignore it. And this match was good, but re-watching Benoit matches now with the benefit of what he ended up doing and how he was going to go to the pay-per-view after he had committed the atrocities he committed, I can't watch it objectively. That being said, it was a very well-wrestled match, but it was also messy because you had all the guys with the leather straps and the... Ow. Anyway... They did that, and then Arn, um, Arn ended up hitting Henning with a tire iron after Arn ended up getting clobbered by Henning earlier, and diving headbutt. One, two, three. New tag team champions. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Chris, for ruining your fucking career by being a goddamn murdering piece of shit. You fucking goddamn idiot. Oh, he had a concussed brain of an 85-year-old dementia patient. Okay, how the hell was he still able to wrestle? That's whatever. Just God damn it. New tag team champion. Poor Malenko. Poor Malenko. Perry Saturn took on Chris Jericho with Ralphus in a dog collar match. This is all because Chris Jericho had <coughs> caused Saturn to lose a match where he had to wear dresses. And then Saturn decided to wear dresses. Here's a question. Saturn wearing dresses, Vito wearing dresses. Which one was stupider? Which one was more damaging to the particular person? I mean, you embrace it and you have fun with the gimmick. I don't care. You get down however the fuck you want. I'm just saying as far as presentation, it wasn't necessarily the best way to present Saturn or Vito later. Um, Ralphus refused to put on the dog collar in place of Jericho. Leaves. And this is one of the last times I think you saw Ralphus with Jericho. Um, <clears throat> because Jericho would be gone from the company soon after. 
and would show up on WWE on August 9th, 1999, when everybody knew Jericho was going to show up, and they still pop big for him. Saturn ended up winning, uh, eventually with a DVD. There was, it wasn't the worst in the world, but it wasn't great. It just kind of existed. And by this point, the pay-per-view was off the rails. Booker T took on Scott Steiner uh, with Buff Bagwell in his corner for the TV championship. Steiner yelled at the fans for, like, ever. A lot of, he just yelled at everybody. Yelled at everybody, and then there were a bunch of people trying to do this and everything, raising the roof. Louisville, Kentucky, trying to be all hip and everything. <clears throat> it's only really one person in Louisville that is any good that uh, displayed any positivity or, you know, displayed anything worthwhile towards wrestling, and you know who he is. But at least currently living in Louisville, I guess is what I should say, or Louisville, however the fuck you say it. Bagwell kept interfering, and eventually that interference caught Scott Steiner the match because he ended up hitting Scott Steiner with a chair, which should have been a DQ. The ref allows it. Booker kicks a chair into Buff Bagwell's face, covers one, two, three. Booker is once again the TV champion. <laughs> cool. Let's move the fuck on. Rick Flair versus Hulk Hogan, barbed wire, steel cage, first blood match for the WCW Championship. Flair says, hey, this is after Michael Buffer took 15 fucking years to get through his intros. In fact, this is all I gotta say about Michael Buffer. Fuck Michael Buffer. Fuck, let's get ready to raw. There we go. Let's just go with that. Can't do that because it's trademarked. Flair says, if I lose, I'm done. But if I win, I'm president for life. For life. And... <clears throat> Flair tells Charles Robinson, again, after Michael Buffer takes 18 fucking years for his goddamn intros, only stop it at your discretion. No scratch, no little bit of blood, no let's just do everything. First blood, by the way, no pinfalls. No pinfalls, no submissions. Keep that in mind. So, they didn't gimmick this up too much. Yeah, they did. They totally gimmicked it up. And unfortunately, it got worse. Because you're seeing Flair and Hogan in a match that they had about eight, or no, eight, Four and a half years prior at Halloween Havoc 1994, no Mr. T being a goofy referee at this point, and no Brother Brudai butchering the friendship, which led to the worst Starcade main event ever. Period. Ever. Brutus Beefcake against Hulk Hogan in a goddamn Starcade main event. That was brutal. <laughs> Hogan got screwed over, even though Flair got pantsed and was drawing and drew and, you know, was bleeding like crazy. Hogan started bleeding. Here's David Flair and Tori. Tori, who looks pretty much the same now. The miracle of whatever secret she has. I assume the blood of the innocent. And this is bad. Really, really bad. Because they were doing the same shit. And it was when they were way older and had more mileage on them. And other people should have been featured. At least in more prominent spots. Sure, Booker T got the semi-main spot of winning the TV championship, and what did it take? It took another year plus for Booker T to finally become the WCW champion. And by then, it was way too fucking late. It might have even been too late if they had elevated Booker in the summer of 99. <coughs> DDP was a three-time WCW champion, and none of his, I think his combined reigns were 54 days? And I might even be overshooting it with that. But anyway, David Flair and Tory, we get more hulking up, a leg drop. Robinson refuses to do the pin count. Or the pin count as opposed to the pin as opposed to the pin fall. Again, first blood. No pinfalls. No submissions. Arn comes down, decks David, Tory attacks him, he throws Tory off. She stays on the ground where she should be, and then she <clears throat> and then he hands Flair the tire iron and he hits Hogan in the face. And gets the figure four on him, and then fast count one, two, three. It's a rotten pay-per-view, it's a rotten main event, and it was pretty much one of the big death nails of WCW. This was really, really bad. And unfortunately, Uncensored 2000, which I did retro-review, was not any better. And then it would lead to the eventual reboot, and me reviewing, retro-reviewing, rather, the last year of WCW, basically. And oh boy, I'm not revisiting that. <laughs> no way. Whoo! Anyway, agree, disagree, what I said, like, share, subscribe, Twitter handle in the description. I'm John Rutland. I'll see you soon.